places that are sort of non-linear and seemingly disconnected, and it also arises at conclusions that also are sort of dissimilar. So to talk about the work, I've kind of fashioned a more linear trajectory, I guess, but it involves talking about the ideas behind the work for a really long time, and then relating it to the work at the end. So it's going to seem sort of abstract at first if it goes as planned. So um, I guess a good place to start with the work is with the state of nature. And for those who aren't aware of the state of nature, it's sort of a, um, oh, it is a, a theorized condition which existed prior to civilization. And it's an idea that arose early on in the Enlightenment. And there's, there's like varying, uh, there are varying uh, interpretations and ideas about what the state of nature would have been like. But the work here and my focus is on uh, specifically Thomas Hobbes' uh, ideas of what the state of nature is or was. And he kind of classifies it as an overall negative place where humans are sort of pitted against one another. Like, because there's no rule of law, everyone, he argues, would act in their own rational self-interest and sort of exploit each other to the point where the conditions in which they existed aren't safe and a sort of brutal. So there's a series of criteria that he outlines in order to clarify what he means by the state. And the first, well, these are, um, that, is a, that life within the state would be short, brutish, nasty, uh, I don't know, other negative, ambiguous words. But he also talks about the state as um, a war of all against all, sort of with that idea of people being in competition with one another. So from that organization, or from that pre, or that state existing prior to civilization, he sort of argues that in order to become more safe and to become, for life to become more stable, humans enter into civilization and they willingly forfeit some of their rights and their autonomy in order to gain more safety. And even though that, it's, I guess it's important to realize that the state of nature as Thomas Hobbes or as anybody talks about it, most likely did not exist in that way. And um, it's, it's purely a, a theoretical exercise, but it is used to justify civilization and the like, willing forfeiture of autonomy. So even though I disagree with the fact, like the factual basis of his argument, I think that um, the criteria that he outlines are still useful. And I find that when I look at the contemporary context in which I exist, uh, whether you want to call that empire or late capitalism or semi-capital or whatever term you want to attribute to it, um, I find that this social arrangement doesn't hold up too well as far as he calls the state of nature solitary and as a war hall against all. And I think that the current social arrangement sort of um, distills and almost, um, I guess, creates those, um, like the alienation and the competition that he described as um, existing in the state of nature. So in a way, the argument for civilization becomes an argument to either disband civilization or to radically shift, I guess, the nature of what of social arrangements within that civilization, that civilization being this civilization. So to talk about that idea further, I used the lens, sort of the lens of survival and what survival would entail in the state of nature. And I think that sort of requires maybe a distinction to talk about further. Um, I mean survival in two senses, in the physiological sense that there is a set of uh, needs that need to be taken care of, but I, I mean it more in the sense of survival of being in the state of nature. And what I mean by that is how it's possible to live under the dominion or the domain of ideological constructs, specifically capitalism, but I would say any ideological construct, and preserve your being, or how it's possible to live. And I guess that requires even another distinction, and that's between living and existing. And for the sake of the work, I would sort of, just to keep it short, I'm going to bridge the definition. I would say that existence is moments sort of when the individual or group is subject to 
the immaterial framework in which, within which they exist, and life or living would be when the individual or group exerts some sort of influence or maintains some sort of autonomy within those structures. So this work um, sort of arises from that, and it arises from my own attempts to achieve some sort of autonomy under, within uh, those ideological constructs. And I think that's most evident, maybe, or easiest to talk about in the prints. Um, all of the works in the prints are actual functional objects that I made. Well, not all of them. Uh, the jeans, the sweater, the backpack, the scarves, the tents, and that piece. And they're, they're all objects that were made with a functional purpose, sort of out of a necessity. Um, and they're, they're objects that I used and I made them to be used. I, I mean, that's my main backpack that I take with me every day, and things like that. So it, there's, a, there's a functionality to the objects. And the reason I created them rather than purchased them is that it sort of eliminates the distance that would be usually uh, sort of ingrained in an object, and that you don't have contact with its production. Uh, or you're, you're not producing it, I guess would be a better way of saying that. Um, and you don't have control over the design of the thing. So there's this distance eliminated. And there's also, um, I mean, in a purely economic sense, I was able to save, or it's, it's a lot more economic to make the work rather than purchase it outright. So I initially toyed with the idea of displaying the objects as physical things in the space. but. I think the problem with that is that almost the work would become about those objects and not more of a symbolic uh, tendency towards autonomy in my work, but work in general. And um, so I wanted to show them as representations because they're more symbolic things to me than actual things. Uh, so I decided that I was going to photograph the work. Um, and I did that, and I did it with models, but having the models, it almost made it about that individual's quest for this abstract idea that I'm talking about. And so I decided to replace the models with 3D models, models, or in the case of the tents, uh, place the tent inside of a three-dimensional, non-existent landscape. And the reason for that is sort of twofold. It eliminates the model to an extent, to whatever extent possible, from the work. But it also, um, it also sort of contextualizes the argument. And that the survival that I'm talking about, it takes place on multiple planes of existence. Um, not simply like uh, of a plane relating to the body, like a somatic plane, but uh, virtual planes as well. And not just digital plane, uh, not just digital, that doesn't mean just digital, but virtual planes. So like, there's this back and forth in the work between virtual and real, whatever real means, um, between the idea to the objects, and then to the photograph, to the 3D modeled element, and then it's printed out automatically, like, eventually as a physical object, or another physical object, but a flat one, in, for, the sh for the purposes of the show. And I think that that way it embodies that, those tendencies rather than making it about those individual objects. And I think all of the works, to an extent, talk about these, what survival entails within, or within, like here and now, uh, to different extents. And I think it's maybe more obvious in other works, but it's all talking about the same things from different angles. Um, I guess I could talk about the other works more, but maybe it would be good to, hopefully that was easy to follow. Maybe it'd be good to like open it up to questions, if you have any. I mean, was that easy to follow? <laughs> I've been like obsessing over this and trying to make it clear and linear because it's not like these ideas formed in that way or in, even chronologically. They're like little bits and pieces that I've had to like from past shows and past work that I've done 
and it all came together in like this <coughs> sort of rhizomatic fashion that's not really clear, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you want to talk about the video? The video, sure. Um, the video is like further, I, I, the video is sort of almost the last minute thing, but I think it's sort of important and that how I was talking about the, oh, excuse me. How I was talking about the 3D modeled elements adding context, uh, I wanted to talk about maybe a little bit techno-utopianism and how I think there's a tendency to think that um, there are, uh, there's like this potential in virtual technologies and specifically within the internet, but virtual systems in general to sort of, I guess, save, or to, I, I don't know, improve the quality of physical systems. And I'm not saying that isn't true, that's definitely true. There's a, like a definite interplay between virtu virtuality and physical reality. But there's, I don't think that's like an end all, uh, I don't think that's the perfect answer. So the video is actually sort of about the breakdown of virtual systems and how they're, they're not, they don't mesh up completely and they're not, essentially how they're not, necess they don't, they're not necessarily an entire solution. There's, series, there's moments in the video, and they're, they're really subtle, but there's moments in the video where the actual physics of the place breaks down, and actually one's coming up. If you look on the right hand side, it goes inside the map really briefly right there, and then there's like other places where the physics doesn't line up, like when it's coming across the lake, the mist covers, the black mist covers the mountain, but the mountain's still visible in the reflection. You can see the end of the map in places and things like that. So that's kind of what it's about. It's more providing context than maybe additional content. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Are there any other questions? Well, well, thanks for coming out.